Hello, everyone. Welcome to this uh, session uh, through this uh, very familiar and modern uh, me mode of communication on this, um, in my case, afternoon, and I think in some cases, evening. I'm speaking to you from Toronto. Um, uh, I want to first of all thank James Bramble, the organizer, for inviting me to participate in this series of talks to mark the 200th anniversary of Napoleon's death, Napoleon Bonaparte's death on St. Helena. I'm a social anthropologist and a tenured associate professor here at York University in Toronto. I happen to be a native of St. Helena and some there listening or abroad will know me uh, as, uh, as their former history teacher. My interdisciplinary work marries history and social anthropology and I will be talking in this series that James has organized um, in the new year on my own work on um, scholarly work and film on St. Helena and the South Atlantic world that James has organized for um, next year. But now I'm especially delighted to introduce the two speakers for today, uh, Mr. Colin Fox and Dr. Andrew Pearson. And with their permission hereafter, if I may, Colin and Andy. Now, let me say that I know Colin and Andy personally, and I know their respective works well. And I want to say upfront that I have great admiration and a great deal of respect for the sustained, rigorous scholarship that they bring to their respective works. Their respective um, scholarly contributions and impact is really very significant over and beyond what they have to say to us today. I'm currently working on a paper in which I'm looking at at the rise of what I'm calling racial consciousness in St. Helena in the 19th century. And two books sit here on my desk as my go-to works on this project. Um, the first I want to show you and uh, make a plug for is um, A Bitter dra Draft, St. Helena and the Abolition of Slavery by Colin Fox. It is meticulously researched and Colin's presentation today is in part a brief synopsis of this very important work. The second work book that I have, my go-to, is Dr. Pearson's Andy's Distant Freedom, St. Helena and the Abolition of the Slave Trade, 1840 to 1872. A brilliant account, again, superbly well-researched and assembled um, of St. Helena's place in the suppression of the slave trade. <clears throat> it addresses the period when a vice admiralty court was established on the island for the trial of those involved in the transporting of enslaved Africans across the South Atlantic and for the liberation of the cargo of the enslaved that they were, that were being transported. Um, these are, I have to stress, must reach to republish his important book in the same manner. Now, in terms of St. Helena's history, chronologically, Andy's work takes off where Collins ends. Though, as I might stress, these are, these are two different stories. Both are accounts of slavery and enslavement, but they address very different aspects of the larger history of slavery and enslavement in the South Atlantic world. I might remind you all folks that uh, Andy led the archeological team that carried out the excavations of the burial grounds of the Africans taken from the ships of these captured slaveries, slavers. In his, um, in his book, Distant Freedom, um, he, it, it's a social history that contextualizes that particular period and the excavations themselves. The excavations of the burial grounds, and Andy will explain why they are burial grounds and not cemeteries, happen to have captured the imagination of people around the world. And this also resulted in a renewed interest in St. Helena's own history of slavery and enslavement. 
But one of the problems I find with this renewal of interest is that the two distinct histories are often collapsed. And the specificities of slavery on St. Helena and its links to the Indian Ocean are frequently conflated with another history that is premised upon the plantation colonies of the United States and the Caribbean and the triangular slave trade and the Atlantic. Now this conflation I think is a huge mistake and so I'm doubly interest, uh, interested and grateful for Andy and Colin uh, for what they will do to elaborate these two distinct aspects of uh, St. Helena's place, both as a place of the, where slavery itself was practiced, but also its role in the suppression of the slave trade. So with that, I am very delighted to introduce to you uh, Colin Fox. Um, uh, Colin, over to you. Good evening. Um, thank you for that very nice introduction, uh, Dan. Um, as you said, I'm going to talk about the indigenous slavery on the island, the slaves that were brought there, often from the Indian Ocean. But let me start with my presentation, if I can get it up. Right. Um, I think most people will be familiar with St. Helena, but for those who are not, I just thought I would show you this map. It's a very small island in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, 122 square kilometers, I believe, um, about halfway between the Cape of Good Hope and the Bulge of Africa. As Dan has been saying, it's very important to recognize that the enslaved people brought to St. Helena were not part of the triangular slave trade in the Atlantic. Neither was slavery on St. Helena the same as slavery in the West Indies or the Southern States of America. Enslaved people were never used to grow and harvest cash crops for export. The island's sovereignty rested with the East India Company and its sole purpose was to provide fresh water and provisions for East India Company vessels returning from India, China and the Spice Islands of Southeast Asia. Slaves were brought to the island as a workforce to directly or indirectly attain that objective. St. Helena was sovereignty generally rested governed with by East... military men who had previously served in India where slavery existed, but in a different form to that seen in the Americas. In this respect, St. Helena can be regarded as sitting in an arm of the Indian Ocean rather than an Atlantic island. Sorry. Okay. Um, the first enslaved people had arrived soon after the first settlement in 1659. Mostly they came in small numbers, although the EIC did send out some ships solely for purchasing slaves, not just for St. Helena, but also for their possessions in the Far East. Ships' captains were instructed to purchase a few slaves on their return voyages and land them on the island. Overall, it's estimated that three quarters of the company's enslaved persons were sourced from Madagascar, the rest from around the Indian Ocean Basin. After 1770, there were also instances of children being enticed on board ship and then kidnapped, or company families returning home from India, hiring servants or nurses, ayahs, for their children, and either selling them or leaving them on St. Helena rather than pay for their passage home. <laughs> St. Helena is chiefly known for being the prison home of Napoleon following his defeat at Waterloo in 1815. His arrival on the island was unexpected and for the first few months he chose to stay in a pavilion or summer house in the grounds of an estate called the Briars, owned by William Balcom, a civilian member of the company's administration. It was in the grounds of this estate that he met and heard the story of a slave by the name of Toby or old Toby as he was known. He was 60 years old at this point. So, sorry, I'm, 
Uh, Toby was described as a Malay, but this is misleading. He spoke a Malay of Portuguese patois, which was a lingua franca in the Indian Ocean slave trading posts. He was born a free person in Mozambique in 1755, but was later captured by Portuguese slave traders. From there, he was taken to Bombay, now Mumbai, where he was purchased as a servant by a military officer, Captain James Tippett. Tippett was posted to St. Helena, and Toby, now aged 15 years, came with him. After Tippett left, Toby was bought and sold several times before being purchased by William Falcon. <laughs> Toby's lived in a hut, the remains of which still exist, and plans are afoot to create a cultural and historical centre by refurbishing this hut, and contributions are needed to achieve this aim. Sidestepping for a moment, it is necessary to know that in 1792, a new set of slave laws had been introduced onto the island. These comprise 42 articles, some of which gave the island slaves some protection from ill use. The most far-reaching was Article 39, which banned any further slave imports to the island. This was 15 years before the law to ban colonial slave trade was enacted in 1807. In Toby claimed that he'd been brought to the island illegally, and Napoleon took the matter up with Admiral Sir George Coburn, the Commander-in-Chief of St. Helena forces at that time. The result was an investigation, and 61 other slaves made the same claim. Of these 61 slaves, only four were allowed, um, as the other had all been brought to the island prior to these 1792 laws. Of the 61, 29 told the inquiry where they had come from, and this is best shown on a map. It can be seen that the numbers, that numbers came from different areas of India, Sumatra and Africa, and even one from the West Indies. Slaves had been transported around the Indian Ocean by Arab, Muslim, and Swahili merchants before the European explorers arrived. But of course, the movement increased when the Europeans entered the area. Because of this, and as with Tony, it's very difficult to be completely certain of a slave's ethnicity. Now, what I would like to do now is to use Toby as a gate by which, by which we can enter and gain some understanding of the conditions under which the enslaved people on St. Helena lived. We know Toby was a gardener, but what about the other occupations being followed? Well, just over 10% of men and women were unemployed, disabled or underage or even in jail. Women were nearly all domestics, cook, domestic servant, needlewomen, nurses, washerwomen. Uh, the men domestics were generally cooks. Men could also be outside domestics, working as grooms or as gardeners, or working in a dairy, or sometimes in the case of children, looking after chickens. The majority were farm workers, laborers, plowmen, shepherds, and stockmen, and about 15% were tradesmen. A whole range of activities there, butcher, cooper, carpenter, fisherman, painter, mason, shoemaker, tailor, and thatcher, etc. And these trades could earn large sums of money for both the slave and the slave owner. Toby lived in the hut, but what about the other slaves? Company slaves lived in barrack type accommodation in Jamestown and Plantation House, the governor's residence. And these were known as black squares. Privately owned slaves might live with their, in their owner's house or outbuildings. Or sometimes if they were married, they could be married, they could be living in town away from their owners. Company-owned slaves were used as servants for senior officials and also worked on the company farms. But after about 1800, the company policy was against slave ownership and the numbers were gradually reduced. Privately-owned slaves were regarded as property and counted with the farm animals. And property was a sacrosanct in this period and outside the company's control. It always reminds me a little bit of the uh, American view on gun ownership. Um, it, if it's not illegal, then certain people want to hang on to it. This is the slave ownership on St. Helena. Perhaps not surprisingly, uh, 
farmers tended to have more slaves than other slave-owning islanders. But over half of the farmers had no more than five slaves, so it gives some indication of the sizes of the farms. Some others, including farmers, of course, had large estates or fields and so on, um, and the non-farmers would be possibly council members or merchants or military officers who had many slaves. I think the largest slave holding on the island was 25 slaves by one farmer. In 1827, there was a list made of 881 slaves, uh, which I'm going to talk to you about more, more later. But from this, we get some glimpses of the kind of uh, what the slavers, slave owners thought of them. I think these descriptions also demonstrate how in different ways these unfortunate people managed their lives. Some making the best of what they had going for them, some resisting authority and suffering the consequences. If we look at the spiritual, mental and physical well-being of these slaves, we don't know how many of the enslaved people who were brought to the island were Muslims. It's quite possible many were. However, the only religion practiced on the island was Christianity, and church attendance was not only expected, but at certain periods it was enforced. There were schools set up on the island for all classes of people. But for the people of colour, the overriding lesson was to promote a sense of knowing one's place in society and accepting Christian moral values. What was really wanted was a subservient, docile workforce. Clothing for women, a waistcoat, petticoat and a shift, and for men, a check shirt, coarse blue jacket, a hat, a handkerchief, no mention of shoes, and these were issued annually. For food, yams were a staple in early times for both slaves and slave owners, but later rice was provided, supplemented with meat or fish. In the 1790s, some slaves took their proprietor to a magistrate's court as they claimed the yams they were being given were scrunchy and the meat so thin you could see through it like glass. The slave owner was told to improve their food or face a fine of 30 pounds. <laughs> Punishment, the lash and the treadmill. Before 1792, horrendous punishments were inflicted on slaves, some resulting in non-judicial deaths. The perpetrators might be fined a few pounds or even let off. From 1792, owners were restricted to 12 strokes of the lash, although magistrates could increase their number if it was deemed a serious offence. In the 1820s, the lash was superseded by the use of a treadmill. There were other punishments, working in irons or given a poor diet, bread or rice and water. Despite the laws, some slave owners still out, dealt out cruel punishments. Although if they were caught, they were brought before the magistrate and punishments were fines and sometimes being given a dressing down in front of their own slaves. In one instance, an officer was forced to retire. So how did it all end? Well, Hudson Lowers had a bad press regarding his treatment of Napoleon, but he is credited with the first steps to end slavery on the island. By the way, that's the English portrait on the left and the French on the right. So you take your pick. Christmas Day 1818 was set as a date after which children born of enslaved women would be free. However, there was a full small print. If the mother was sold, her free child over the age of four stayed with the slave owner as a sign of indentured servant. If the mother was freed, the owner had the choice of keeping the child or letting it go with the mother. A new governor came in in the mid-twenties. This was uh, Alexander Walker. He called the slave owners together and put it to them that the free children now growing up would soon want to be paid. That their slaves were getting older and going down in value, but would still need to be looked after if they became firm and also in old age. This was part of the law. In both events, it would be a double whammy for them, as both would add cost. The best and the most fair solution, most popular anyway, 
uh, was to free the slaves, but how was that, that going to be done? The majority of slave owners, not all of them, demanded recompense to do this. The company was in financial trouble, having lost the monopoly on the Chinese tea trade, and they wouldn't pay up. And so the solution they agreed on was that the slaves themselves would have to purchase their own freedom by being loaned the money and then paying it back. This had the benefits to the slave owners, benefits to the slave owners that these freed people would then have to keep working for them. The first step was to establish a value for each slave, and this would allow the owners to know how much money they would receive and also tell the slaves how much they would have to pay back. The valuation of 881 slaves began in 1827, and this record reveals a breakdown of the names, ages, occupations, origins, and characteristics of each slave, and also the names of their owners. But there were many issues arose from this establishing what they call a fair system, but this is too complicated to go into here. This scatter chart, scatter chart, oh, scatter chart um, gives uh, an idea of the valuation of these males and female slaves. The trend line makes it quite clear that the men were valued far higher than the women. No doubt, suppose physical strength was seen as the most important factor. Perhaps of the men who set the values had tried washing and ironing clothes by hand, their views might have been different. It's also clear that the value of both men and women slaves peaked in the mid-20s and fell off rapidly after the age of 50. And finally, it's easy to understand why young children were taken as slaves. They were an appreciating asset and could be more easily coerced into a life of slavery than an adult. <laughs> This, is, uh, this chart here shows the numbers of slaves on the island throughout its occupation. The red line shows the number of people described as free blacks. These were people of color who for various reasons were not slaves. They were small in number even in the early days, but the numbers rose rapidly after 1800. The yellow line shows the number of slaves on the island increasing year by year up to about 1815 when Napoleon was present when there were about 1,500 enslaved persons on the island. The number then fell rapidly after the children of slave mothers started to be born free, and after 1827, when slaves began being manumitted. In 1834, a virtual bombshell hit the island. The East India Company were forced to relinquish control of St. Helena, and the sovereignty reverted to the crown. This resulted in the garrison being disbanded and replaced with British army troops. The company pensions were reduced and the island's economy went into free fall. At the same time, slavery was abolished in British colonies and the slave owners here were recompensed to the cost of 20 million pounds to the exchequer. Santalina and Ceylon were actually excluded from this legislation. So the freed slaves on Santa Lina were still for, required to repay their loan. This plot here shows the numbers of Santa Lina slaves being emancipated each year and the amount of loan repaid. Initially, only a few slaves were freed and these people repaid around 35 to 45% of their loans. But the manumission process only really got going in 1832 and continued as planned over the next five years. However, the difficulty in finding work and no doubt a simmering anger at the treatment when compared to the colonial slaves who were freed without any payment, the amount rapidly fell off to zero. In late 1839, the island government, well aware and sympathetic to the hardships being suffered, was ordered by London to compile a dossier on why the loans had not and were not being paid, and it was simple enough. These newly freed people were in a very poor situation. Money on the island was short, supply, and it became hard to find work, and the oversupply of workers forced wages down. About 20% of the women were forced to become prostitutes to support themselves. Many women left for the garrison troops, and many both men, both men and women emigrated to South Africa without paying off their loans. Slavery was officially 
abolished on the island on the 27th of May 1839. And pleas were made to the Treasury and pleas were made to the Treasury in London to write off the loans as there was no possibility of any further repayment. But it was only on the 3rd of October 1840 that this was finally agreed. And overall, about 10% of the loans had actually been repaid. It was a trifling sum compared to the 20 million pounds. <laughs> The governors and slave owners on St. Helena believed that slavery on the island was less onerous than in other parts of the world. It may have been so, but I think Lawrence Stern was correct in his assessment, part of which I use for the title of my book. Disguise thyself as I wilt, still slavery, said I, still thou art a bitter draught, and though thousands in all ages have been made to drink of thee, thou art no less bitter on that account. I'll leave you with one last question to ponder. Who should I or you admire the most? The man who refuses to submit to being a slave, runs away and suffers a lifetime of punishment? Or the one who works hard, earns money to support his family, educates his children and ultimately buys their freedom? I don't know the answer. But now I'll pass you on to Andy for his presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Okay, well, thank you very much, Colin. Um, what I want to move on to um, is to talk about, as Dan stressed, a very separate um, strand of St. Helena's association with slavery and with the slave trade. Um, what I'm going to talk about concerns the abolition of the slave trade and specifically St. Helena's role in the legal and naval suppression of the Atlantic Middle Passage, which occurred during the middle decades of the 19th century. And this episode has emerged or re-emerged really as a result of historical and archaeological research, artifactual and scientific investigations, which have taken place over the last 15 years. And collectively, these studies have revealed really a previously neglected narrative about St. Helena, which has previously disguised a, a truly significant contribution made by the island to world history. Before I begin, though, um, I just want to give kind of a standard if you'd like a health warning about this presentation. As Dan said, it derives from archeological investigations of graveyards. So there are going to be some, not an enormous number, but nevertheless some images of human remains within the graves. And I'm aware that um, you know, in using them, they are potentially distressing. So I just wanna make kind of viewers aware of that. Beginning then, I want to make three points um, or emphasize three points. As Dan said, this is a quite separate episode to that of St. Helena as a slave keeping colony. And despite the fact that these two episodes come up against each other almost precisely, they do need to be treated as distinct. Second, St. Helena's role in the abolition of the slave trade can be taken as a counterpoint to its slave owning centuries. But as I'm going to explain, that's only true to a certain degree, as with everything to do with 19th century abolition, this is a story laced with ambiguities. Finally, just a, a note on terminology, I'm gonna be talking about liberated Africans, um, almost capitalized the L and the A. That was a 19th century legal term for those who were taken from slave ships and who were subjected to British judicial proceedings. For convenience, it's one which is adopted by modern scholarship also. However, in using this term, we as historians are very aware that in reality, the freedom of these so-called liberated Africans was of the very most limited type. Placing things into some kind of timeline then, for reasons I won't really go into, St. Helena comes into the fray of abolition in 1840. Now, obviously, as we're all aware, the Abolition Act came in in 1807, but the slave trade continued throughout the 19th century. St. Helena's role is very much in the middle decades, the 1840s, 50s and 60s. So as you can see from this slide, as I said, the final emancipation of slaves occurs in 1839, 
and as Colin has stressed, these are very much of Indian Ocean descent. In 1840, just literally a calendar year later, the first of these so-called liberated Africans are landed at Lemon Valley. And these are, by and large, the first large-scale influx of African peoples to St. Helena. In 1841, the Rupert's Valley Depot, which we're going to talk about, opened in the late 1840s. That's the peak number of receptions of liberated Africans to St. Helena. And that, as I'm going to describe, will tr triggered a humanitarian catastrophe in its, in its reception camps. In 1852, the Brazilian slave trade ends. In 1865, the Cuban slave trade ends, and that's effectively the extension, the extinction of the Atlantic slave trade. And the Rupert's Valley Depot in St. Helena closes shortly after that. Where we come in, or where my own role came in, was in 2007 to 8, or that's where it began, running, as Dan alluded to, the archaeological excavations in Rupert's Valley ahead of the airport project. Just to give you a final piece of context, um, some facts and figures. The number of slave ships, which the Royal Navy, in its role as military suppressor of the slave trade, the number that were brought to the island, well, the number of cases which were adjudicated by its court, 439. However, a large number of those ships were sunk at the coast or never made it to St. Helena. Only 87 of those vessels actually carried slaves. However, if we move to the next set of statistics, the number of slaves that those vessels carried, those 87 vessels, is 27,000 people, which at a rough average comes out as 290 per vessel. But some of them were small and some of them were much, much larger, carrying something of the order of 800 people or sometimes more. The numbers who died at sea, very large, nearly 2,000. The number who died immediately after landing, nearly 900. And the number who were, in quotes, liberated by the courts, something over 24,000. So we're dealing with substantial number of people. After liberation, which is to say after the court proceedings, but while those liberated Africans were still on St. Helena and within the depots, some 7,000 more people died. And that would be in the, the days and probably just the weeks that followed their landing. I will then talk at the end of this slide, uh, of this presentation about the emigrants and about the small number who then settled on St. Helena. But what I really want to do in the next 15 minutes or so is really just narrate the basics of this story. We, we as a team have spent a long time sort of dealing with the history, dealing with the artifacts, piecing together the archaeology, the, the history, the science to try and tell you know, an integrated story. So really that's all what I, that I want to try and do within the short time here. In 1840 then, when a Vice Admiralty Court was opened on St. Helena with the purpose of trying slave vessels which were brought to the island, the islanders resorted to type in the sense that they used their standard quarantine valley, which was Lemon Valley, which had been used for centuries to take in anyone or any vessel which had disease aboard. It's a pristine landscape in, in many ways. Um, certainly it's undisturbed by modern development. So what you're able to see if you visit it are a lot of the remnants of the liberated African depot, including here, the hospital building and the doctor's house. And in terms of a kind of fusion of the narrative, we have the doctor's letters, which he wrote in that room. And we can see the things that he saw and he's, the landscape that he described and the events that he described within them, they're still very much legible to us. So in the foreground, we have the doctor's house and the hospital. Below this, we know the graveyards are there, of those who didn't survive. And then at the bay are the barracks where um, the initial ships were landed. But Lemon Valley, despite its, its use in the past as a quarantine station, really was too small and too distant and too hard to supply for the numbers which were coming in. It was never really, as I'm going to note in the couple of slides time. It was never anticipated that large numbers would arrive, but when heavily laden slave ships with hundreds of people at a time started to land, the St. Helenian authorities looked for a better or a different solution. Where they settled was Rupert's Valley, which really became the prime or the primary base for the liberated African establishment from later in 1841 through to the closure of the depot, which as I've said, 
coincided really with the end of both the, slave, the Atlantic slave trade and with St. Helena's role in that. In terms of trying to locate where the archaeology was, Rupert's Valley is, is pretty much unpromising territory. Certainly when you arrive, you have no indication of what's there or what it holds or what its archaeological or historical significance is. However, lost in the scrub on the lower slopes are small but very, very densely packed graveyards, one in the lower valley and one higher up. And collectively, we think there are about 7,000 to 8,000 people who were buried there. In terms of the facilities that were provided, they were pretty rudimentary. This is a sketch plan taken from high up on the hillside, looking down towards the bay. And effectively, it shows more or less all that was there at that time. There were 11 large tents made from the sail and the timber of um, captured and broken up slave ships. And these sat behind the 18th century defensive lines. And there were hospitals and cookhouses and small ancillary buildings. Occasionally, as shown in this picture, or this drawing, a hospital ship or a quarantine ship was used to kind of boost capacity. I want to take two points from this. First of all, is really that these drawings and others show a very orderly situation. And in the next slide, I really want to talk about how very often that wasn't the case, but it's controlled, it's quiet, it's clinical, but really that, that belies the reality at a lot, of, a lot of times. But the second is to make a more general comment. I talk about, as Colin has talked about, things where St. Helena really, despite its remoteness, is a pivotal place in world history. And this is one, because the idea of the refugee camp now, or the, play, the camp for displaced persons, it's a commonplace. But places like St. Helena really trailblazed that, because these are the first instance of trying to house people who were genuinely displaced in large numbers. So where St. Helena, Cape Town to some extent, Sierra Leone particularly, they really trailblaze now what's become a commonplace. As I said in the beginning, this is very much a mixed story. Yes, abolition should be seen as a good thing. And I think St. Helena's contribution is very valuable as much as it's underrated. However, the actual execution of that um, well, on the island was, was very mixed. And it all really stems from these, uh, these three quotes, I think kind of pull out a lot of what I, I'd like to say. First of all, the top one really just stresses that the government in London never expected St. Helena to play that role and never really understood how it was going to happen. The second, from an eyewitness, was, this, was the sheer horror of the arrival of a slave ship and just the logistical nightmare that the St. Helenians, so distant from anywhere else, had to deal with. Um, I won't sort of go through the quote because I'll, I'll leave it up long enough for for you to see it, I hope. But I think it encapsulates what John Mellis, who was heavily involved with this, saw, and all of those St. Helenians and all of those colonial servants who had to deal with this, this day in, day out for the best part of two and a half decades. And finally, and then related to the first quote, is the fact that where I think intentions were good on the island, they were never really supported from London. Funding was never available. There was always this sense that the depot was going to be closed, but it never was. So it was never funded, never renovated, and therefore the conditions that the liberated Africans came to and which the St. Helenians had to work with were always very rudimentary. Moving then to the, the more recent past where these discoveries came in was within the context of the airport project for the island. In 2007, environment, an environmental statement was written of which cultural heritage was a part. And what my role and my team's role was, was to first of all, identify what existed on the island within the footprint of the airport and its associated components, in this case through Rupert's, the Lincoln Hall Road. And then also following that to deal with how we turn mitigation to address First of all, how we'd avoid them. And I would stress that avoidance for an archaeologist is always the, um, the preferred option. But where we couldn't, to look at what you might call preservation by record or preservation by excavation, to actually investigate. And in the case of the graveyards, 
to remove a very small area of graves from the footprint of the Hall Road where we couldn't go round it and we couldn't go over it. But again, I should stress, it wasn't a decision that was ever taken lightly and avoidance was always the, um, was always the key point. What we found, and certainly with hindsight, confounded everything that we thought. On an old map, also drawn by Meles, in fact, um, the, whose eyewitness um, account of the slave ship we've just talked about, um, the, these liberated African graveyards were marked, one in the lower mid valley, one in the higher one. We thought we might clip a small amount, amount of the higher one, but in fact, what we discovered was about 180 graves, and in those, gra those graves, in a mix of individual and multiple interments, we found 325 individuals. What you can see here in this cascade diagram on the right is basically the most densely packed of all of those, which was seven people within a single grave cut, a six by two grave cut, which in the modern day we would expect to hold a single person. What I'd like to stress is I'm calling them graveyards. These are effectively institutional areas for the rapid disposal of the dead in a crisis situation. They are not consecrated ground, they're not recognisable as graveyards. They are a response at the time to, again, what we might call now a public health crisis. And again, correlating with what Colin's slide showed about the age of the people within this. This is, to put it at its most bleak, it's largely a graveyard of children and young adults. The average age of the people that we excavated is around seven, is around 12 years old. It drops off rapidly through adolescence. And as far as we are aware, there are practically no people who are present within the area we excavated who are over the age of 35. So this very much correlates what we know of historical accounts of the slave trade is that effectively it preyed on the young, it preyed on children. The osteological, which is to say the, the analysis of the bones, was extremely revealing in lots of ways. And again, that very much corroborates what we know from the historical accounts of the slave trade and its horrific brutality. We found relatively little evidence of the causes of death, but that's largely because we know that most was caused by kind of diseases, as the Victorians would have called them, the diseases of filth, things like dysentery, which don't leave traces on bones. Nevertheless, we have two individuals who were shot because we know that because we recovered musket balls. We have an enormous amount of evidence, bottom left, for scurvy, which is clear evidence of long-term malnutrition, and a decent amount of evidence, as shown by the right, for the violence that was visited on the people within the slave ships. So what you have there are rib fractures on an adult male, who's precisely the group of people who you would expect that kind of violence to be visited on, on the slave ship. What I want to do, and I think what it's really important that we emphasize, because I think for me, this is the significance of the Rupert's Valley site and what we can say above and beyond the history, is that it, it brings us face to face, quite literally, with the victims of the slave trade. And one of the problems we have as historians is the numbers are so huge that we can't grasp them. We stop thinking about people as individuals and we see this sort of mass of nameless and faceless victims. But with Rupert's Valley, you know, really, as I say, you can't avoid thinking about these people as individuals. And it's also quite possible to move beyond thinking about them as victims and look actually as them as people in their own right. And one of the discoveries that we made was about a third of the people we excavated, the individuals, about 115 had chipped or filed modified teeth. And these are very clear cultural markers. Um, I should stress that the um, image on the left is of a Moro girl from um, within an African homeland rather than any, any image from St. Helena. But these are highly revealing and they also tell us or remind us about things that we couldn't have seen as archaeologists. So when the Africans arrived on the slave ships, they would have had their hair dressed in certain ways. They would have had ritual scarification. They would have had tattooing. They had language. All of these things are, are lost to the archaeologist, but I think the dental modifications really remind us of these people who have a sense of their culture, of their aesthetics, of the groups that they belong to. And not only that, and startling really, 
is the artifacts that we found. It's a min it, they were found with a minority of people, a very small minority, but they contradict the accounts that we have of people who, you know, again, these sort of human cattle, if you will, that's how they're described, being taken onto the slave ships, literally stripped naked of everything that they had, all of their possessions. And that's very much something that comes through in the historical accounts. But what we found within the graves are a small number of items of jewellery, beads, horn, cowrie shells. And these must have been extraordinarily important possessions to the people who managed to secrete them. Um, one of my colleagues has done wonderful work to look at all of these, and I'm just going to concentrate on two that, um, that Helen looked at. The first is a bead, a glass bead and horn necklace found around the neck of a two to three year old child. And the skeletal an analysis shows there was some kind of brain disorder. This child was extremely sick. And ethnographic evidence suggests that this is comparable, comparable to healing amulets. So not only do we see that this individual had jewellery, but we can see that the Africans around them on the slave ship or in the, within the depot are still able to exercise a degree of control, of agency over their life, even within the restrictions of slavery and on the slave ship. The second is an extraordinarily poignant find, and that was one of four coffin burials of neonatal stillborn children. Tiny, tiny box. There's no scale on here, but it's effectively the size of a, a child's shoe box, if you will. But within that coffin, and again, this cascade diagram from the top to the bottom, the wooden lid, the baby, incredibly poignant within, within the coffin, covered with a woolen shroud, coins over the eyes, a pillow underneath its head, all of which are European traits. And we have a lace bonnet and evidence of textiles. But underneath, an African woven bead mattress. It's tempting to think that the mother was involved, we'll never know, but clearly there's a fusion of the African and the European within this tiny, tiny um, artifactual assemblage. I need really, you know, quite clearly I'm only scratching the surface of an enormous amount that could be said about this, but I'm, I'm mindful of time. I just really want to finish the narrative then, the historical narrative. Of these people landed on Saint, tiny St. Helena who survived, they posed both dilemma and opportunity for the British. The dilemma was what to do with these people who clearly couldn't be supported economically on an island which was already going downhill. Opportunity, because its own, the British's own emancipation of slaves in the West, West Indian colonies created a dearth of labour there on the plantations. So what better solution the British found but to ship these people across the Atlantic further on a, if you like, another middle passage to populate those, those plantations as indentured labourers. Although there was a theory that the, this emigration was voluntary, really in reality it wasn't. And the other thing which I think is, is again very poignant, there is absolutely no evidence that any person who ever went through St. Helena's depot ever went home to Africa. About 500 people of the first generation, those landed from the slave ships, they remained on the island. By about the 1870s, that number had come up to about 750. So out of a population of 4,000, these Africans must have been a prominent part of the population but also, as I've kind of shown from the dental modification, an extremely um, visible part, a very different part, not European, not of Indian Ocean descent, but African, speaking these lang different languages with dental modification, with scarification. And the texts are, the descriptions of them are quite scathing at the time. Well, the, you know, they won't integrate into society and, and they, weren't they weren't converting to Christianity. But I think the reality is that the background of these people was just so extraordinarily different that it's no surprise that they did struggle to interact. And it's no surprise that also they kept to their own communities. I just want then to come to a conclusion. Macroscop macroscopic studies of slavery, as I've said, deal with unimaginable numbers and observe large scale trends. And they work because of that on an impersonal level. 
perhaps 10 to 15 million people were shipped across the Atlantic into slavery. Over 3 million, we know that as much, were shipped across the Atlantic in the 19th century alone, supposedly post-abolition. But the human face of slave tra the slave trade is rarely seen. Early photographers captured a few images of its final victims, mainly in the Indian Ocean, as in this image here. But these are rare exceptions. And as the historian David Blight has written, words and imagination are all that we have to enter the transatlantic slaving world. So it's easy, therefore, to take a dis dispassionate view and overlook the individual. But the subject of Rupert's Valley offers a counterpoint. Archaeologists has brought, archaeology has brought us literally face to face with the human consequences of, this, of the slave trade. And in its own right, therefore, Rupert's Valley deserves to be known and recognized and talked about widely. It's rare, it's extremely rare, it's disturbing, and it provides a very uncompromising insight. And it reminds us too that although St. Helena is primarily remembered as the place of Napoleon's exile, it played other roles, roles which are truly significant in terms of world history. Nowhere is that more important or, or more true than in terms of the military suppression of the Atlantic slave trade. When St. Helena entered the fray of that con conflict in 1840, the trade was, was at its height. When Rupert's Valley and its depot closed in the 1860s, the centuries old trafficking was gone. Not all outcomes were positive, far from it, but we need to acknowledge St. Helena's contribution as well as, and indeed above all, the lives and deaths of those Africans who passed through its depots. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Uh... Uh, Andy, and before that, Colin, for these incredibly thoughtful um, presentations. Uh, I have received uh, via Alex two questions. Um, I might have a third uh, that I could add. The first question is from Christopher, Chris Williams, and uh, it's for you, Colin. Chris is curious about the jump in the emancipated slaves as he writes, in 1834. What was the reason for that jump? Sorry, I'm not quite sure. Right, so I, I read, uh, Chris uh, is curious about the jump in emancipated slaves in 1832. What was the reason okay. for that yes. jump? Okay. Um, the... There were plan there was it's quite a long story. Um, the, the problem with 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 uh, manumitting the slaves on the island was that there was a worry that there was going to be a shortage of manpower, and also that they didn't want all their the slave owners didn't want all their best slaves being uh, released at the same time. So they agreed decided to do a kind of five year plan. And they would choose the most deserving slaves, part of them to go first, and, and then the least deserving at the end. But there was also a seriatim of, of, of going down to uh, make sure that they didn't lose all the best at the beginning and all the last, all the worst at the end. It's a, it's a horrible thing to talk about, but um, that was the plan, the five-year plan. And, but before that, there had been individual slave owners who were doing private kind of arrangements with their own slaves to free them um, and possibly leaving, I don't know, but the, the data is, is not always totally clear. But I think the five-year plan from 1832 to 1836 was the organised plan by the government to free all the slaves on the island. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. And before I go to the second question, um, can I just sort of comment on uh, one of the things that unite both presentations? And it's the factor that uh, Andy emphasized at towards the end of his, uh, his uh, talk, uh, Andy, your, your conclusion about the necessity to humanize um, what otherwise just become sort of numeric data. And I really do appreciate the efforts on both of your parts to, to do precisely that. And the scale of St. Helena is such that it does enable that, uh, that vital project of uh, 
of, of uh, bringing the humanity to this story that, it, that really needs to be brought to it. Um, I have another practical question that I think is attended actually more for James. Oh, sorry. And Colin's reference to Toby is another example of that kind of individualizing and humanizing um, otherwise what would be an abstract story. My, the second question on my list comes from Tara Palembi. And Tara wants to know what progress has been made in the restoration of Toby's house. Uh, I'm not sure who is any, in a position to answer that. I think it's directed at you, James. Thank you very much, uh, Dan. And, and thank you, Colin and Andy, for the fascinating presentations, which are very thought provoking uh, and quite moving. Um, the, the current status of Toby's cottage is essentially that it is a ruin um, sitting next to the Briars, which is the house where Napoleon first stayed when he arrived on the island. Um, but we have had a survey conducted by Brent Fortenberry at Texas A&M University. Um, and if you attended the last uh, online presentation that we, we gave, you would have seen some scans uh, and photos of that site. Our plan is to rebuild Toby's cottage to the condition it was in when Toby and other slaves lived within that cottage, to tell the story of slavery on the island um, and to put it in the context of Napoleon's time on the island as well. Um, we've had that costed and we have a figure of 100,000 pounds to complete that project. We may be able to complete it for less, um, but to ensure we have a full budget for interpretation uh, and to do research on the site, we're, we're allowing a budget of £100,000. Um, we're actively fundraising for that now. Um, and I would, of course, put the appeal out to anyone viewing these presentations. If you're interested in supporting our work, please do consider making a donation on our website, um, napoleon200.org. There's more information on Toby's Cottage on the website and we will be updating that with more information as we go along. Um, yes, so that's the current situation. Please do consider supporting us. Please do consider sharing what we're doing with your networks. Um, while I have the, the microphone down before I, put, I hand back to you, um, can I also just take the, the opportunity to announce that our next event will be on the 10th of December um, it will be um, a more light-hearted event than tonight, which is obviously a, quite a sombre subject. Um, we'll be joined by two eminent Napoleonic historians, um, Alan Forrest, uh, Professor Emeritus at York University, um, and Adam Zamoyski, uh, a very well-known eminent writer on Napoleon and Napoleonic history. Um, and we'll be discussing uh, what we're calling Napoleon's Last Battle, not Waterloo, but the battle for Napoleon's legacy, uh, which of course commenced on the island of St. Helena with the writing of the Memorial of St. Helena uh, and the writing of a number of other journals and first person testimonies about Napoleon's time on the island. So that's the 10th of December, same time, six o'clock. Uh, please do consider joining that event. Please do consider signing up on the website and please do consider making a donation if you can. Okay, thank you very much. Back to you, Dan. Thank you, James. Uh, can I ask you, uh, you mentioned the professor being from York University. Do you mean York University or the University of York? I'm at York University here in Toronto. I mean, and we University of York. ourselves from the University of York. Yes. All right, thank you. Um, I've been checking on the uh, uh, questions here and no further questions have come through from, um, from our attentive audience. Um, perhaps I could ask a question of a speculative nature of, uh, of you, Andy, and it relates to my own efforts to, um, to kind of think about and speculate on the some of the social and um, consequences of the arrival of this number of people from the African continent 
at the time that they did arrive, particularly the 750 who, um, who stayed on on the island. And the question has to do with the sense by which, and it is my project, the, this, uh, what this presence did for the making of the St. Alenian. I mean, it is my kind of um, thinking that th there was something about, I mean, your reference to the camps is very insightful, but there's also something about the spectacle of the ships and the scale of the arrival itself that created a certain, in my imagination, certain set of conditions against which the local people began to see themselves. And so the speculation is that this presence um, and the spectacle of the presence, and I'm, you know, I'm using spectacle quite deliberately here, had, may have had something to do with what I kind of think is the rise of racial consciousness in St. Lena towards the end of the 19th century and in the actual making of the a notion of a St. Elenian identity. I wonder if you have any thoughts, speculative or otherwise, on that question. Um, well, you, you, thanks for putting me on the spot. Uh, <laughs> it, I think it's perhaps a, a, a difficult thing for a non-Saint Helenian, perhaps, to to comment. Are right, you going to put it on. back on, on to me then, eh? No, no. <laughs> um, I think in terms of, I think in terms of the arrival of the slave ships if you're going to talk about the abolition or the suppression era, I have a sense to some extent that Rupert's Valley was perhaps a little bit as it is now, out of sight and out of mind, mm -hmm. close to Jamestown, but quite sequestered. Mm -hmm. And what I feel the, if you want to say the average St. Helenian, or certainly the Jamestown resident would have seen was the Navy. And it, it brings not only the Navy in large numbers and in, quite literally riotous shore leave, but it also brings the slave ship crew. I mean, one of the things I didn't touch on um, is that it is the slave ships which are tried because the slave crew were immune for various legal loopholes. So what you have is this extraordinary circumstance in Jamestown where slavers, the Navy who've been chasing them, and they obviously for good reasons hate each other with a passion, are ranging around the town um, I think that is what the St. Helenians day to day would have seen. There was an initial sympathy for the liberated Africans, which gave way to a weariness for the way that they competed for resources, for food, for medicine, for medical attention, because, you know, no matter how badly the liberated Africans were treated, the St. Helenian, St. Helenian poor at the time were, you know, equally neglected in many ways. How it moved forward from then, um, it's very difficult for, the, the sources don't really deal with it because they, once they get to simply recording the liberated Africans via census, you rather lose any sense of where they are and how much they're mixing. But you, you would have to think for the generation of, the first generation who probably survived, you know, some of them survived till 1900 and we know that one survived into 1928 they must have been a very marked and separate part of the community and I think there must surely then have been uh, one is one has a sense that they didn't integrate and they were not allowed to integrate so I think racial consciousness and perhaps in the literal sense an exclusivity perhaps arose and which might explain again why now, there's very little emphasis in St. Helena on African heritage. You know, Boer, Boer heritage, yes, but African heritage really isn't evident at all that, that I can see in sort of traditions or folklore. So I'm sorry, that's a very long winded answer, but it seems to have been quite marked and then dissolved comparatively quickly with the second generation of descendants. Thank you very much, Andy. Um, I um... James, with your permission, um, I'm, I'm still inviting questions, but I see no further questions arriving in my, uh, in my box here. So I'm going to assume um, that I might close the session at this particular uh, time by just thanking uh, Colin and Andy again for these absolutely 
superb presentation, so thoughtful, so moving, and uh, cause for a great deal of uh, thought on our respective parts. So thank you both and thank you everyone for joining us in this particular session. See you next time.